If the Bible's got you tied in knots, if you're burdened with religious thoughts, come grab a drink and join the choir. It's Heretic Happy Hour. Good morning, Vietnam. Hey, it's Keith Giles, and uh, this is uh, Heretic Happy Hour podcast. Uh, welcome to the show, and um, I'm joined by... My two wonderful, amazing heretical, 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 heretical guests <laughs> and friends, uh, Matt and Jamal. Guys, say hi. Hi, friends. My name is Jamal Javanji. It is a pleasure to be back on the Heretic Happy Hour podcast with you guys. I'm the author of Living for a Living. And um, guys, man, it, this is the first time we've ever recorded this episode. It's a historic it, day. It is. It's the first time. Yeah. So let's hope we get it right. Otherwise, we're going to have to do it again. We don't yeah, want to I don't do want to have to do it again. Yeah. Well, that, and that makes me Matt. And I am the author of Heretic. And I got a couple other books coming out sometime soon, but uh, I don't know. I don't have dates. So I will announce dates and titles as we get closer. But uh, excited to be here again on another episode. Totally, totally. And um, I want to I wanna just uh, let the listeners know that we have a hotline. We have listeners? And. <laughs> uh, do we i don't know i think i think we have a couple I think there's somebody out there yeah, I'm um yeah, that's right that's right but um so if, you know for our parents uh if they want to call into the hot, hotline we do have a hotline and i'll give out the number um so if you guys wanted to uh take a moment to get a piece of paper and uh a pencil you can write this down the number is 240 Three four three seven three seven nine. So two four zero three four three seven three seven nine. And um, the operators are are standing by, and and no matter when you're listening to this, they will be there. So you can just call that number, and if they don't pick up because the the lines are jammed, you can just leave a message on a voicemail, and or you can even send a text message because I know that's popular these days. So people can send a text, and we'll get that as well. And we yeah. do have a text that came in, so. Awesome. Okay, here it is. Quote, I'm a bit behind in the episodes, but I'm listening to, to uh, episode 24 about Israel. I'm reminded of Jeremiah's warning from Jeremiah 29, um, chapter 29, verses 4 through 9, to exiled Israel and, and think it's applicable to those trying to bring about the end times and espousing pro-Israel politics to the detriment of the Palestinians, stewardship of the earth, i.e. taking climate change seriously, et cetera. Thanks for your work, Josh. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Is that really a question? Uh, there's yeah, no not, question there. <laughs> right. It's just kind of a statement. But <laughs> is, I'm not uh, familiar with that passage. Uh, is it Jeremiah 29, 4 through 9? Well, you know what? If you had a copy of the new Revised Standard Comfort Prayer oh, Bible from Zondervan, like a pro. You, all, you, would, <laughs> you would have it. You would be able to look it up. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I don't know either. I was going to look that up, that, that reference up too. Yeah. Does anyone know what that is? Shoot, someone quick. Someone um, quick. Someone, someone call in. <laughs> no <one's laughs> someone call. We're going to wait. Does our producer, we're going to wait. Our producer, wait. Our producer <laughs> may have it. I think our producer. <laughs> we're going to wait. Let's just wait until somebody calls in and lets us know. Yeah. <laughs> does anybody have a Bible? <laughs> Let's listen to us. No, well, it doesn't it does, exist. It doesn't exist, bro. It's not, it's not real. Mm, what? Uh, apparently, there was a warning. There was some kind of a warning that Jeremiah a- gave to Israel <laughs> that is similar to um, a, a warning that might be given to uh, Christians who are seeking to to make some end times uh, prophecies that they believe exist come true. Yeah. Well, well uh, yeah. And, and I mean, let's uh, we can think a little broader, I guess, without getting specific. I, I, I try to make the point in Heretic about the fact that a lot of the warnings from the Jewish prophets and even the book of Revelation which often gets twisted and, and manipulated by like the left behind dispensationalist type folks. But it's, it's really those peoples. And I don't want to use that as like an othering, but like the people who hold to that eschatology uh, it's, it's their viewpoint that brings about these sort of warnings. So it's almost ironic that, yeah, of course it's applicable because I think when we don't take climate change seriously, when we don't take our, uh, very highly nationalistic um, po- politics. When we don't take the warnings against those things seriously, those uh, bad things happen. Things like in Revelation happen. The quote unquote end of the world type scenarios happen. So I think it's always applicable. Um, 
without knowing exactly what 29, four through nine is. Sorry. I, I don't memorize the Bible. Well, actually I have a thought here mm-hmm. I wanted to share. And then I actually, our producer has, uh, he went uh, searching the archives and he did find this passage. So, um, but I, here's a thought about prophecy. And, and again, it's, you know, um, just any kind of prophecy. My, my, my understanding of prophecy is that all prophecy is self-fulfilling. So, cause I don't actually believe, I think creation, there's, it's a misnomer in my un- understanding that creation was something that was done in the past and that's over now. I actually think creation is ongoing. Like we're always creating um, in, in mm. space and time. I mean, because if you think about it, like, I mean, just turn on the news. Um, I mean, who's creating the world? in the present tense. I mean, it's us, it's human beings. And, you know, it's whatever the future is, it's never, we never experience it in the future. We always experience it in the present moment. And it's interesting just from this, the way the laws of the universe work, this, this thing, people going to call it karma, whatever you want to call it, but it's, it's a sense of cause and effect, sowing and reaping. What you do has a result. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So everything you do. So honestly, like, People, you know, if you, I don't know, this is maybe a little different topic, but if you've ever thought about a human being, and if you tend to think negative thoughts, that person's going to hurt me, that person's going to do something to me, and you just think about that repetitively, you're te- those things tend to happen, or the, 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 the relationship with that person will tend to manifest in such a way that will confirm what you've thought. And I honestly think that that's, but we're doing it. So like, I mean, cause I've, I've actually done some experiments where I'll start to think really positive and good, and beautiful thoughts about a thing I thought was going to happen or a person and what ends up happening is quite different. So it's, um, what if on a collective, this is just a hypothetical, but what if on a collective level, human beings are projecting onto the world, their own fears and insecurities or what they've been told will happen and actually is making it happen. But it's literally like you can, you choose. So it's like a menu, whatever you want to, to eat, to experience, to have, you just choose it. And then you begin to like speak it out there. And I think Christians are doing that as a great example when it comes to like these Bible prophecies. It's like, that's what they've been told. It gives them a sense of certainty. Oh, this is what's going to happen. We don't really have to, it's just the way it's going to be. And this gives them a sense of certainty. And then they start to live into it and create that reality. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, it's exactly, well, it's exactly true that, um, I mean, I absolutely agree that with the idea that um, either Americans, especially American evangelical Christians who have this dispensational end times view, which again, we've already covered this in previous podcasts, but um, it does give you a certain mindset um, that, that tends to have you uh, not only create in your mind certain thoughts and feelings about certain people groups, but even uh, allows you to go against the teachings of Christ um, as far as as far as like loving people, caring for, having some humanity for people who are suffering, simply because well the Bible says that has to happen, so we're just going to let it happen. In fact, we might even you know encourage it because we believe that in some odd twisted way we're gonna we're gonna speed the return of this guy Jesus, who by the way is the guy who told us not to do the thing we're doing. So it's this circular, ridiculous thing mm-hmm. where. Um, yeah, I, I think that's why it's so dangerous, this whole end times uh, dispensational view. I don't really see much good at all in it, really. It's hard It's hard to look at the fruit of that way of thinking and see much good in it. Because it, what it ends up doing is it, it, it gives Christians the excuse to disconnect from the world they actually were born into and live in right now. They have no concern for or mm-hmm. the ecology, mm-hmm. for um, you know the world we live in, or even other people. They, they uh, tolerate and even encourage war and genocide and things like that. Like, and they live in fear and they encourage other people to live in fear. Like there's nothing really at all I could say that's good about it. Other than if you happen to have a book on the blood moons, it's great for you because you're going to sell a boatload. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully those, hopefully those days are numbered. I, I hope there's not a lot of prophecy books coming out I hope selling not. millions. Well, well, uh, you know what? <laughs> don't try to prove me wrong. <laughs> well, you know what though? I think this, this question was great. Thank you, Josh, for the question. Cause what it really did was illustrate the fact that if, if the three of us had had our news on ribbon, New Revised Standard Version cover print Bibles uh, at hand, we would have been easily, you know, easily able to reference that verse you, you talked about in Jeremiah. I, th- I think a lot of listeners are going to be disappointed that w- we don't record these episodes with our Bibles open and ready. I know. <laughs> now the truth is out. Yeah. Now they know the truth. Um, yeah. But we are so glad, though, that Zondervan has uh, given us uh, 
a whole stack of, of the, these new Bibles to give away. And they've been, we thank you them for that. And if you would like to see their full lineup of Comfort Print New Revised Standard Version Bibles, visit nrsv.net. And we have only three episodes left, which means uh, in this uh, in this giveaway, which means we only have three Bibles uh, left to give away. Um, we have our winner for this time is Alessandra Haynes. Woo-hoo! She shared online that her favorite episode was episode 54, uh, which would be interview with Dustin Kinsrew of Thrice. Uh, the topic was the Omni God. And um, if you would like to win one, you can do the same. Just share your favorite episode of uh, the Heretic Happy Hour podcast on Facebook or Twitter. Tag one of us. But if you really want to win, don't tag Matt. And um, Or you can call the hotline with a 60-second hilarious Bible story. And uh, there you go. And we do have we do have a hotline. Yes, we do. Mm. Yeah. And we do have a, we also have a heretic of the week, like every week. It's the heretic of the week. My name is Derek Flood, and I am a heretic. Hi, Hi Derek. Derek. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Derek, it's so good. It's so good to have you on the podcast. I am a huge fan, by the way. Uh, I, I, Disarming Scripture was an excellent book. Uh, it really blew my mind. And um, yeah, I've been loved, loved your stuff. And it's such an honor to have you uh, as our heretic of the week. Oh, thank you. Yes. I'm just curious. When did Disarming Scripture come out? When was that published? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I'm, not- I'm the same way. I'm like, when did that book come out? I-, I live in the eternal now. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh. What an answer that is. <laughs> That's beautiful. I feel like it was like yes. 2007 or eight. That's that sure. Kind of like <laughs> I think it, oh gosh, no. I was think that? it was more like um, uh, 2014 or something like that. Was it? Okay. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. You might be right. Know. Let's say it's right. And someone can correct us. I'm sure they will. We'll just yeah. go with that. We'll so go with we're, I need to ask you though, our, our kind of most important question, Derek, is... Um, so why why do people consider you a heretic? Oh, I'm sure there's lots of reasons to consider me a heretic. I I don't think that God's a monster. Um, I don't think that you should do every single thing it says to do in the Bible unquestioningly. <gasps> um, I uh, I don't believe in original sin. Um, I'm not sure that sin really is the big problem in the world um mm-hmm. uh, i could mm. there's lots lots and lots of reasons yeah mm. i like that last one unpack that last one yeah me us. too i know that. Like, hey, please do if sin is not the big problem well, well what is or why isn't it the big problem sure well i mean <clears throat> it, it also it, a little bit too as to how you define sin so if sin is defined as sort of like individual uh, like you know failings and stuff then i think that bigger problems are are systemic problems um there's problems with people using power in the name of god um you know oppression it's all the things that cause really major suffering aren't these individualistic problems and so i don't know that the the the, the answer is kind of a i guess what you could call it an old testamenty kind of answer sure. In, in the sense of like we just need to like you know obey the rules and then everything will be just fine um i question that and i question that kind of as being the the only problem that that we have and i think it gets away from a lot of um other problems you know that that people have, that people mm-hmm. suffer from yeah yeah it's interesting yeah it seems like the church in america especially you're right i think we it seems like they're mostly concerned about what what Joe Blow and just, you know, the random Christian in the pew is, is, you know, sin is defined as that, right? Like it's managing those kinds of things. Like, um, don't drink, don't cuss, don't look at pornography. Um, right. And, and, and it seems like they're way more fixated on that than they are with the things you mentioned, which are like, you know, war, genocide, poverty, um, like the bigger, bigger problems that are facing the planet. Right. And if you look at um, the stuff that Jesus did, you know, who he's reaching out to, it was almost never people who needed to repent. It was people who were ostracized and, and, you know, shut out and needed, you know, physical needs and, and, you know, poverty and that kind of stuff. And 
And so when you have, and you have all these people who are, you know, we all have stuff we're going through and hurts and pains. And I heard the other day, there was this preacher guy with a microphone and he was trying to find something that we had done and like, oh, maybe you stole some bubble gum. And I'm like, oh man, people have like real problems in their lives that mm -hmm. they need love and God and help with. And, and you just sort of like had this total non-issue right. thing that like, who cares, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, lo I love what you're saying. I, <clears throat> I, you know, one of the things I've, uh, I've talked about just in some of my own work was just th the idea of sin. You know, really the is the root of it. You know, I, I, I think of it like what's it's not the specific actions. You know, because that's a, easy to you know look at that. Those are really symptoms, but the systemic things behind it. You know, for example, like the, the sense of lack. You know, which gives rise to twisted desire which is really what most of the commandments are about anyway. It's just how to restrain this desire, but it doesn't really deal with the root essence of like, well, hey, you know, have, have we dealt with this sense of like there's something missing from our our being, you know, which is really causing this this desire to become twisted. So I hear what you're saying. I really think it's um, a powerful, just a powerful example of, you know, um, that, that at the heart of, you know, what we would understand God to be is, somebody who wants to get to the root issues to bring healing and not, not focus on, you know, you know, you know, like if you have a headache, I mean, you can take Tylenol, you can you know, pump the painkillers, but you know, if we're not getting to the root issue, why, why, what, what's your body trying to say, then you're really not getting to the place of healing. And I think that's what I hear you saying there. Absolutely. And it's not at all to say that, you know, I mean, definitely the point is we should be loving to each other. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not at all to say like, Oh, that doesn't matter. It's like, that totally does matter. But I just somehow think that, the focus on sin, it just, it just doesn't, it seems really in our culture and our time, just really kind of mm. unhelpful. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, it's funny because I've, mm. like, to me, people have asked me that question of like, what is sin? And when I, with the three of us, we've, over the, over the podcast, I think we've dealt with this question a bit. And, and to me, it just kind of comes down to the simplicity of it is, if Jesus says that the greatest command is to love God and the, and the second is like the first to love your neighbors yourself. And then he gives us a new command, which is to love one another as he loved us. It seems to me that the greatest sin would be to break one of those commands, which means the greatest sin is to not be loving. Right. Right. You know, that ties in to what I was thinking about with, um, I, since you guys are called the heretic happy hour, I was thinking about heresy and <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking that the really, the only real uh, the, the problem with heresy uh, and the whole concept of orthodoxy is that it's like super tied together with violence you know like when you think of heretics you think of burning at the stake and boiled mm -hmm. in oil and beheaded and all these like horrific torturous ways to murder people and you know and nowadays you know we we thankfully have this thing called um the the bill of rights which stops people from, you know, killing people for religious reasons, but, but still people get fired from their jobs and, and, you know, careers get ruined over, over this heresy stuff. And it seems like that, that's the only heresy is calling someone a heretic and ruining them because of it. You know what I mean? It's like, if, if, if the main thing we're supposed to be doing is like, Jesus says, look, hey, I got one command, love each other. And Paul defines love as do no harm to your neighbor and you've fulfilled the entire law. Then when you intentionally harm someone um, because of orthodoxy, it's not orthodox right. because it's not right. Because the only, the only way to be orthodox is to have orthopraxy yeah. running right. to act right and to think right which is to be to think lovingly and to act lovingly. You and if you're not then it's like i mean and, and just in like basic kind of duh terms what's worse <laughs> misformulating how the trinity works or chopping someone's head off you know right. i mean right pretty easy to tell which which is more hurtful and wrong <laughs> and not like jesus right. and unloving yeah, yeah i mean it's funny because someone just sent me an article today um, that some guy, I, it, it was funny cause like I, he didn't know that I knew the guy who wrote it and he sent it to me. And, um, and it's kind of this big long thing about essentially doubting the Trinity, trying to break down, like there's some verses here that sort of would cast doubt on this doctrine of the Trinity. And maybe basically what he was saying was that the Holy Spirit is the father and that the father really is just the father and the son. 
And at the end of the day, I mean, I'm reading it and I'm re- reading the article and I'm thinking, who cares really? Like, why, who, why is this a big deal to anybody unless, you, unless you're someone who really, really, really needs this doctrine of the Trinity to be true? And now, okay, I'm going to fight you because I disagree with the way you're looking at these scriptures. But ultimately, it doesn't change anybody's life. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't make any difference to the way anybody follows Jesus or follows his commands, loves, loves people, loves their neighbor, cares for the poor, reaches out to the oppressed. Like Whether you do or you don't believe either a trinity or a duality or a modality or whatever, who cares? Like, Why are we fighting and arguing over these right, things? Right. Like, it don't, They don't really matter. And even if you have something that does matter, like say my believing something causes me to be a jerk, Mm -hmm. you know, um, the way that you respond to that, you know, um, as a parent, for example, isn't by being equally awful back, but by by modeling, you know, Mm -hmm. love Mm -hmm. and and respect and restraint and and you know, all those, all that good stuff, you know, you sort of like, like I tell my kids, you, you know, Jesus and God turns good guys into bad guys into good guys, you know, it's, but it's, it's that kind of way of, of enemy love. And the whole idea of we are Orthodox and you are not is so not enemy love. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. And I think it certainly seems that um, there, there, there seems to be a growing, well, growing minority maybe of Christians who are really questioning this. Um, it's it's okay to have your beliefs mm-hmm. and your doctrines, but what really matters is orthopraxy, how you practice yeah. whatever faith you believe. I mean, it's a slow movement, but it's um, well, it seems to be it seems to be one though. Yeah, I, I think so. I hope so. Anyway, I mean, um, maybe I'm just looking through my very narrow lens here, but it it, it sure feels like. There is a growing movement of mostly probably younger people, although I'm not a young person. Um, but yes, you are. It's no. just, age is just a number, Keith. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, young people like me, uh, <laughs> 52 <laughs> and younger, who, um, yeah, are just really reaching this place of like, yeah, orthopraxy is way more important, uh, and uh, and even that it doesn't even matter what you call yourself. Like, if you want to call yourself a Christian, fine. You want to call yourself a Buddhist or an atheist or whatever? I mean, okay, like the, the, those labels don't seem to matter as much as kind of you were saying, Derek. Like, are you a, are you a decent person? You know, totally. And you know what? I think that Jesus would totally agree with both of those things. I think you can make an extremely strong biblical argument that the main focus of Jesus was orthopraxy, yeah, and that he did not care about doctrine. And and formulations of things, and he didn't care about rituals and and stuff like that. He cared about loving people and having other people love people, and that that was his bag. And and similarly, the you know the the thing he, that you were saying about like it doesn't really matter what label you are. You're a Christian, or you're a Buddhist, or you neither. You know, he was always saying that kind of stuff about like you know the story about the centurion. You know. Um, is he's basically making that exact same point. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, um, mm. Derek, I, I, when I think about your work specifically, at least you're, you know, um, speaking of disarming scripture, it, you know, what comes to mind is to use a historical reference is when, you know, the people used to believe the, the world was flat and there was a lot of fear associated with how far you could go, you know, so you just travel a certain way. You feel like, you know, people thought uh, people would fall off the edge of the earth. And then they discovered that, there was a curve to the earth and there was some roundedness to it. I know that there's still some flat earthers out there right now, but there was a curve. <laughs> yeah, don't, 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 and, don't kick the hornet's nest, dude. <laughs> right. But, but like that was a revolutionary thing. Cause then once that fear was taken away, they could actually explore that. Oh, wait a minute. There's more here to the story. Um, and then we could visit other new lands and, you know, obviously discover new peoples and, you know, all that kind of thing. So, at least from a European perspective, you know, there was this, there was a sense of just new, a new world that was discovered. And I, I think you were one of the first people <clears throat> that I can, that I, in my journey to introduce this concept that there's an arc, so to speak with the, I don't know if that, that if I'm using the right words here, but there's an arc to 
like when you look at the Bible, you look at the scriptures and that there's more going on here. It's not a flat, you know, all the words are like, you know, this, everything that's equal in value that there's actually a unveiling of, um, that there's a, there's a, there's an unveiling of, of divine intention, even through these archaic old stories that are very violent that you actually, you actually, God is like unpacking, um, and, and really subverting ideas of, res- of violence, of, you know, all these kinds of things and, you know, revealing that God is not actually interested in sacrifice, not interested in retribution. And this was always, uh, this was a progressive sense. I think your book was one of the first, I mean, there's a lot of books out there now that talk about that. I mean, I think of a lot of Rob Bell's work, you know, what is the Bible and stuff, but I feel like you were on a, the cutting edge of that, of that, uh, introducing that conversation. So, I, and it true, it totally impacted me. I remember having a lot of conversations, even with the producer of the show about that concept with, uh, with Ralph, you know, who's behind choir. And it was just so revolutionary to all of us. But I'm just curious um, for you, like what led you, how did you come to this conclusion I've, before so many other people? And, you know, it's, it's easy now because we're, so many of us are having this conversation, but I'm just curious what led you to that conclusion and how did you begin that process? Did you ever see yourself writing a book that would be so influential in the lives of so many? I'm just curious what your process has been. I mean, the process of how I got to the book was a struggle. You know, that I was basically asking those questions and working through them. I was in seminary and I'm reading the Bible, you know, translating it from the Hebrew and the Greek because I'm a nerd. And so I'm just like, oh, let, me just, let me just, so let me just like, I don't know, let me, let me just go through and retranslate the Psalms from Hebrew. Sure. And I'm reading them like, and I'm like, and I think of Psalms usually, I guess I, I don't know, there's this way that I read before where, I would I would read only the parts I would I would I would see only the parts that I highlighted. You know what I mean? So like all the good parts, I'm like highlight, 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 and then I go to the next one. I'm like, oh, I don't know, skip, 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 skip. So highlight, highlight, highlight. Hmm. And but now I'm going through it like letter by letter because I mean I don't know I'm really bad at Hebrew, <laughs> so it's super hard for me. So I'm like just like a like a monk copying letters, you know, <laughs> transcribing stuff. And and I'm and therefore I I can't gloss over anything. I'm and I'm seeing like good gravy these psalms are like super nasty violent yep. you know there's all these like you know these songs about like you know please kill my enemy is extra hard you know and and i'm like wow mm-hmm. yuck and 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 then i start looking deeper into other stuff and i'm seeing i'm i'm finding all these things that you know you guys had mentioned um you know genocide you know justified in god's name and stuff and i'm like whoa how can it be that this book that to me is like this window through which i you know i i have the the writings of jesus and i and i feel like i remember like i had this experience with god before i read the bible and and then i read the bible and and what i thought my as as i read the words of jesus is it's it's you you're the one i i recognize who you are i recognize this spirit that's been talking to me um and you know telling me that i'm loved and there he is in red yep. And, and at the same time, at the same time, there's this, this book is also really especially awful and mm. immoral and horrifically so. And, and how can that be? How can my beloved sacred Bible also at the same time be this? You know, and at first I start off with, I don't know, maybe the Old Testament is just bad and the Old, New Testament is good. But, but actually, you know what? There's, there's also problems with the New Testament if you read it in a certain way. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it does justifies slavery yep. um i think it justifies uh child abuse yep um you know and 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 so the, so it's not just a trajectory from old to new but you know you if it, assuming that we don't want to say that slavery is fine you know the, what the new testament says is slavery is fine as long as you're decent to your slaves mm-hmm. you know you can be a christian and have slaves right. and i don't think anybody would would want to make that argument that mm-hmm. that sounds like a good plan today and, but you need to, but if you read the Bible in a, like I was, like you were mentioning on uh, the sort of the straight off the page view of this is what it says. This sets the tone for what's right forever from the new Testament. Then you have to condone slavery. You have to condone, um, you know, beating children with whips. Mm. Like it says, I think that's in Hebrews. It mentions that it just sort of as a matter of fact, like, well, you know, as children, we were all whipped by our fathers. I mean, everybody knows that. And, and the thing is, 
if it's a cultural statement of, yeah, at, at the time, that's literally what happened at the time. That doesn't mean that it's how you should continue. Anyway, so I, I, the, the, whole, the pro- whole process was struggling through that and working through that and trying to find an answer to how to deal with that and looking at lots of Bible commentaries and finding that the, I thought their answers were just all really disappointing. Um, and so I, the book was sort of the, the fruit of working through that. And what I basically found was that there's a way that Jesus is reading the Bible that is extremely different from the way that I learned to read it as an evangelical and the assumptions that I make as an evangelical. Some of the assumptions would be that the entire book is sort of like first person written by God Mm -hmm. and everything in there should be, um, you know, should be accepted as this is just right. And, Mm -hmm. and, and And that's the evangelical view, obviously. Yeah, I would say. Right. Yeah. Yeah, It's sort of the, yeah, it's, it's uh, the way I've, understood it is it's the well and I, and I believe this for the longest time too was like approaching the bible as a flat bible and then it took me a l- the longest time to figure out that there was another way to look at the bible which was um to to, to take a jesus centered position on the scripture like to start with christ and to read the whole bible through the lens of christ uh and then oh wow that that did a lot for me like that helped me to kind of um you know to to make sense of it yeah, and what what helps me too is something from Walter Brueggemann, which is that the it's not that the Old Testament has one narrative; it has lots of them, and they're kind of all in in conflict with each other. Like there, oh, there's a whole bunch of different arguments. You know, there's the argument from the mm-hmm. law that says if you follow these things, then good things will happen to you, and if you break these commands, then bad things will happen to you. And then the Psalms is all about them going, "Hey, I've been keeping these commands, and good things are not happening to me." And this other guy is breaking them all, and. <laughs> And so I want I want him to get all that punishment that you said he's going to get because that's not fair. And then you have Job, you know, who's just saying, I think the whole thing is just a big crock and I question everything. And and those are all together in the same canon, you know, which is pretty incredible that you have all these dissenting voices and arguments back and forth. You have the prophets saying like, you know, the, you have you have the law saying, hey, I care a lot about these rituals. And then the prophets going, I, I could care less about these rituals. In fact, rituals make me sick and i want you to focus on loving instead and it's just this it's a dialogue it's a back and forth dialogue you know and and so it's not that you're supposed to find it, it you can't find the narrative you have to it's more like i don't know picking the channel you like to watch on tv but not all the channels are good or or listening to a debate and not being surprised like when like if there's a debate between you know two political parties of course they're going to disagree. So it's not like, oh, I found a contradiction. You said this and the other person contradicted you. It's like, well, yeah, that's what a debate is. And so <laughs> right, the, right. the Bible is just, the Old, the Old Testament in particular, is, it's like an anthology of all sorts of different views that are arguing with each other, trying to find truth. And Christ is one particular way. And the, the another thing that, that, that really helped me a lot too is um, a thing that I got from um, um, uh, loader and he was he has a book called um jesus and the fundamentalism of his day and i put that together and i'm like yeah that's when when he's talking to the religious leaders and the pharisees and the sadducees the key thing is not that they are are jewish or that um you know that they the pharisees have a certain view and the sadducees have a different view it's that He's talking to fundamentalists, Mm -hmm. people who have a fundamentalist way of approaching the Bible, which is you do this. It says, you know, don't break the Sabbath. And so the end, you know, and if you break that, then you're not orthodox and then we're going to kill you and we're, you know, you're a threat and, and, and so on. And he is everything he says to them can so appropriately be applied to American evangelicalism. You know, it's, yep. it's so they, they, they read the Bible like the people that Jesus called hypocrites and, 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 they, and, and they haven't changed either. It's like, you'd think that like after slavery, they'd be like, Hmm, maybe we need to revisit this and think about this, but they haven't there changed at all how they read the Bible from right. the, the, you know, that's the same assumptions that 
it says it's just right, and I can't question it because it's God's word, and so it says slavery is good, and so I believe it. That's what they said back then, and, and there they didn't really fundamentally change anything. They just can maybe like now they have goatees and Hawaiian shirts or something, but <laughs> it's it's nothing's nothing's really changed at all, and and it, it needs to change. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Paul Paul's conversion is a conversion out of fundamentalism. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a conversion from Judaism to Christianity. He's he he was he considered himself a Jew. It's a conversion out of that, and so and so that's really to me the the thing is mm. is reading the Bible like Jesus and Paul, where they're able to look for the good in it and find that good and hold on to that. But basically, almost asking the question: Does the way that I'm reading this lead to love? Mm. You know, does does the doctrine that I'm formulating from this lead to love? You know, and if it doesn't, mm. it's just mm. wrong. And and he would just feel free to just ignore stuff and be like. You know, it says to, to <laughs> maybe, maybe it says to not heal on the Sabbath. Maybe it doesn't say to not heal on the Sabbath. Anyway, um, it's good to heal, so I'm going to heal, and I don't really care. Right. I and mean, it's just like, you know what I mean? He just, he wasn't so much like finding some, es- like, like evangelicals would be like, okay, well, the way that I as an evangelical can justify that women can speak in church would be, you know, all this sort of like hermeneutical gymnastics mm-hmm. you have to do. And yeah. Jesus is more like, nah, I'm just going to do it. Right. It doesn't even matter. Yeah, it doesn't even matter. But uh, but I want to I want to ask you something, Derek, because there's something that, for me, when I was reading disarming scripture, I think if the, I mean I love the whole book, but there was one major aha moment for me reading disarming scripture, and I want you to kind of unpack it if you can. So it's the part where you explain what's really what Jesus is really saying when he's talking to the Pharisees and he talks about the unpardonable sin. You know what I'm talking about? Um, I'm maybe. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Well, so I'm reading this part of, the, of your book, and then you you made this point about how when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, I think he had just done a miracle, right? And then they accuse him of being uh, doing it by the power of Satan, and then he says in response to them that there's only one sin that will not be forgiven. Right, and it's 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 the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But you you hit a little point there. Oh, okay, right. That just blew my mind. Yeah. So I'm you know what I'm talking about kind of finish the sentence and then explain how you arrived at that. Well, if 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 memory serves, what I was saying is that the unpardonable sin is what well, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit means that this that you observe that the Spirit is doing something in people's lives. And you you block that you block that you block that love that that that's happening, God's work in the world, because of your 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 doctrines and you're saying this isn't right and shouldn't be this way, and so you stand in the way of what God's action is. Right. Is that kind yes, of what you were but, referring but see, to? You actually maybe <laughs> and see, I think this is what you were saying. Maybe maybe I got into it. Uh, but tell me tell me uh, if this is what you. Because this is the part that I read that I was like, holy crap, or at least it led to this logical conclusion for me. It was like, holy crap. What Jesus is telling the Pharisees is that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to is to uh, deny what you see with your own eyes that God is actually doing in front of you because it contradicts what is written. And I thought, dude, that's the perfect answer for these people that say the Spirit will never contradict what's what's written. It's like, well... Yeah, actually, I think the Spirit contradicts what's written all the time. Even in the Bible, we see yeah. that, right? There's a lot of times where, where it's like, well, no, no, it's written here, you know, that you're not allowed to eat unclean uh, meat. But yet the Spirit told Peter three times to, you know, kill and eat. Right, right, right. Like, well, wait a minute, what's going on there? But so anyway, that was, that was the epiphany for me, Derek, when you, when you kind of, uh, you kind of explained that and you kind of walked it out a little bit deeper and it was sort of like, oh my gosh, that was the huge takeaway for me of like the tension between what's written and what the spirit is doing right in front of you. That's cool. You know what I think happened is I think that you kind of did a riff on, 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 what I, <laughs> on what I was saying and took it a step further, which is fantastic. You know, it's, it's like when you listen to a song and the song has like this right. special meaning of like, it was that time when I heard that song and it this takes on this whole meaning that this, it's, art does that, right? Where, where 
you know, right. you it's so it's not wrong. It's not like you've misunderstood it. It's like you're taking it. Maybe I'm not, I'm not sure I, I recognize that. So thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm going to give you I'm going to give you credit for it. <laughs> OK, I'll, I'll, well, we'll share. We'll share. OK. OK. Anyway, that's awesome. that's something that's really we, good. We did that. Derek and I, we did that together. Yeah. yeah. I guess the, the last question we you know like to throw out there is um, where what are you hopeful about as you look into the future? And uh, what are you working on currently? Is there anything that you're involved with right now? And how can people uh, stay in touch with your work? That's a hard question with the hopeful part. <laughs> um, <laughs> our, 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 political, our political climate has made it hard to be hopeful um, for me. And so I'm trying to, but I know that as a white male, you know, I have no clue <laughs> about like real suffering and 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 real hardship and everything. And so I've been trying to just you know listen to people who've been doing this rodeo a lot longer than me and who, who you know and and hearing them just saying like this isn't new this 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 crap that we're going through. This is just maybe it's a little bit like a megaphone to stuff that's always been there, but this isn't new. This isn't this isn't some crisis. This is. It's, it's been messed up like this for a long time and right and they're like have their long perspective you know um of 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 you know that you know surprise things were not totally fine with martin luther king jr in the 60s and like oh we fixed it all you know it's like <laughs> well we we made yeah. some progress but we didn't <laughs> fix it it's you know hatred and racism and all these things are still there and they're still here right now and so anyway, I've been trying to listen. I, I'm, I'm, I'm right now. I'm kind of in listening mode, and and also just sort of in like you know spiritual recovery mode. I'm trying to like stay off of Twitter because <laughs> Twitter bums me out, you know. Um, and it's, and so I, I like have like you know every so often I'm like okay I can't I can't take it I got to go back on Twitter again you know and yeah. then I'll see and I, I'm and I'm pretty good about like curating my Twitter feed to have mostly nice people on it. <laughs> But, but anyway, I've been sort of just doing some soul care and stuff like that. So I don't have any new books um, that are coming out. I'm I've just been kind of like taking a hiatus and trying to stay healthy and trying to listen. And so that's that's where I'm at with I'm trying to have hope in but but hope with eyes wide open. And that's that's hard. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm right there with you, man. It's it's hard. Uh, it feels sometimes, yeah, like it's, it's the worst yeah. it's ever been. But like you said, I think it's just more that it's more visible maybe, but it, it's not anything really new. It's just, it's just hard to see it being so accepted and part of the mainstream. But uh, I, I try, I don't know, uh, I try to say, well, I, I've got to trust that Jesus is right. And that somehow if we just continue to follow him and put our faith in kind of following this example and, and living out the gospel somehow in the end, it is all going to work out. So I hope, I hope so. Maybe, I'll, maybe a book will come out of it. Who knows? It's always with all my books. It's always this thing of, I don't think I'm going to write a book, you know, I'll, I'll go through a struggle. And then at the end of it, I'll be like, Hey book, <laughs> you know, but I don't, but I never in the middle of the struggle be like, this is going to be a great book. It's like, no, it's just a bad struggle, <laughs> you know? So, so anyway, <laughs> <laughs> totally. yeah oh that's well, great well i'm thankful that you've you've written books so it's been hmm. you, you, it's had that's a good lot of ripple effects so and i know i know you're aware of that but just yeah hmm. absolutely so it's, yeah thanks derek absolutely. all right guys hey, you bet thank yeah, you appreciate it okay that was awesome i i gotta say i um i really love derek flood and i i'm kind of bummed that he's not um like I wish he was like blogging more and you know, that he was out there more. Cause like he wrote that great book disarming scripture and uh, I'm just waiting for the next thing. It's been a couple of years now, but yeah, I love it. Yeah. No, his book, um, his book disarming scripture is really helpful though, especially in, you know, this ties in obviously with our, with our episode topic uh, is God violent. His book was really helpful for me in when I first started, uh, really exploring that issue and, and trying to answer the question, is God violent? That was for me growing up. I don't know about you guys, but there was a couple things like hell and the rapture that really, really rubbed me the wrong way and was horrible for my faith. 
but the violence of God was also one of them. And it was always assumed that God was violent and completely other. So therefore God could be violent and yada, 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 yada. But that book totally helped me. Uh, other books, of course, but well, um, well, totally, really helped. It, it did yeah. totally. And Derek, Derek Flood's book, you know, Disarming Scripture. I, I feel like that is very. It's a pioneering work. You know, some some books come around, and you know, I'm sure there were people talking about this, you know, back then as well. But like, I don't know for whatever reason, Derek's book just kind of jumped on the radar, and um, he 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 elicited a conversation that a lot of folks at that time, I feel like we're not having. And uh, I remember this is back in the day. It feels like it's a whole other lifetime, but I remember making a comment and I'm not going to mention names here because we don't want to throw shade to folks on a podcast like this, <laughs> but there was somebody who is in some circles, you know, pretty, you know, also carries a lot of kind of a, you know, a, it's a, a reputation for being a pioneer and, in what we would call deconstruction in some ways. Um, but I remember mentioning to this guy in a dialogue we were having, and I said, I, I think I asked him, or I, I don't know if it was more, I was making a point to him. I said, you know what the difference is between like ISIS? Like, you know, when I say ISIS, I'm talking about like the, the Middle Eastern group who, who claim to be the, you know, true followers of Islam who like behead people and commit acts of terror. I said, you know, the folks who like ISIS who feel like they're, following God's direction by committing murder and genocide and um, and the difference between them and the ancient Israelites that we read about in the Old Testament that also did those same acts, beheadings and, you know, mass uh, murders in, 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 in the name of, in genocide, but all done in the name of God. I was like, you know what the difference between those two groups are? And he's like, what? And I said, nothing. <laughs> and, he, and he like flipped out. And this is a well, well respected Christian, biblical, biblical deacons, people who he was very much involved in, de in the deconstruction world and, um, you know, kind of coming out of institutionalized religion and all the whole thing. But he flipped out and was like, you know, you've lost the faith, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I mean, he, he, I'm paraphrasing here, but he just basically was like, thought I had went off the deep end by suggesting that the ancient Israelites may not actually have heard from right. God, even though they said that God said to do this and wiped out all these, you know, tens of thousands of people. That Millions. I, I, million. And I suggest yeah. just the suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Like God, even though they said God said, just because it's written in the Holy Bible, which was put together in the fourth century by a select group of people, even though it says that, um, I just made the assertion that maybe that was not God, but their own projections. And I'm telling you, it was just like, it, it, you know, like shit hit the fan. It was like, I, I became a heretic for saying that. Um, you know, I think at that point, I think, you know, I mean, there were other things going on, but I mean, it was just like, you know, Jamal's this heretic. Don't listen to him. Beware, be careful, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, all of the and, and it's it, I find it to be fascinating. So in a dialogue we were continuing, I noticed language that he was using to describe the actions of the ancient Israelites, and he would say, "Well, they liquidated," and he would use the word liquidation, yeah, not not murder, <laughs> slaughter. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm like well, wait, wait, like are you, you mean like? <laughs> I, and I caught that, like the psychology of that. I was like, so even the way he would describe the what the Old Testament Israelites would do, he never called it from what it was like murder or killing even though even to say they killed right. they killed they wiped he couldn't use the word he used the word liquidate as if like liquid i was like wait a minute liquidate like a, a like on, hmm. on, a, on, a, on a balance sheet where you liquidate assets like, yeah, right. like we're talking about living breathing i mean these people have organs hmm. and consciousness and they're living breathing human beings and you're and even the animals like you're ending the life of these folks in the name of God, and you call that liquidation. I just found it to be cognitive dissonance at its best, which Christians are, you know, I mean, it just, it's obvious. So it's just like, this is, this is just stunning to me how far from common sense, like you, that we have gotten as human beings so disconnected from our sense of morality right. of right and wrong. And again, I'm not talking about this in the unhealthy sense, but just like, Guys, take murdering tens of thousands of people, men, women, and children. If you get to a point where you have so disconnected from your spirit and your heart uh, to know that that's actually 
an immoral thing, then man, we've missed the complete right. boat. Like this is absolutely that's heresy. It should be no. I, you see, this is the thing, and uh, and this is why I'm so thankful for people like Derek Flood and, and others like Roger Zach and Brian Zahn and um, people like that because um, for me it boils down to this, and I say this all the time, but I, I'm happy to keep saying it because it's, it, obviously it still needs to be said. There is the difference between something being biblical and something being Christ-like, and the problem sure. is when we have a flat Bible perspective. That's that only if you have a flat Bible perspective. Can you can you with a straight face say that the that that God in the Old Testament is the same God that Jesus is talking about when he talks about it, the Abba and he says if you've seen God you've seen me and you know he's he's showing us uh, this loving giving forgiving merciful merciful um, you know radically accepting and affirming God and then you want me to believe that that's the same God who commanded the Israelites to slaughter children and toddlers and split open pregnant bellies and to not show any mercy. Like, really? Like, the only way you could do that is if, again, you hold a flat Bible perspective and you, and you that's then you could say that's biblical. Yes, it is biblical to to commit genocide and, and uh, slaughter and, and to also embrace things like slavery and uh, patriarchy and polygamy and all these other things. Those are biblical ideas but they're not Christ-like ideas. And if we start with Christ, then we cannot end up in that track. And so I, I'm grateful that Derek and others have given us permission to look at those Old Testament passages and say, well, I know it says that they thought God blessed that, that God even commanded them to do that. But because I can see who God really is through, through Christ, I can look at it and say, you know what? Actually, no, those guys were wrong. Those guys, uh, as Paul says, there was a veil covering their eyes that, that they didn't really see clearly who God was. And only in Christ is that veil removed. Yeah. And, and, I, and before anyone accuses us of Marcionism, I don't think anyone, and correct me if I'm wrong, is saying like, we just chuck everything out. I, it just seems like they got some stuff wrong. It's, it's this, the God is God. God's the same God. God the God of that, that people worshipped uh, in the Hebrew Bible. It's the same is, God, is, yeah. It's still the same guy. It just, it just doesn't mean their theology was always correct. And and I just don't get why we just, I mean, I guess in one sense, I get it. Like if we hear that, oh, well, the God was a little bit different than we thought. And well, we just, we're going to chuck the whole thing out and we're going to be Marcionites and all that. I, I mean, I get that propensity because that's just human behavior. We come, we become really dualistic. Our pendulum swings really far, but it's like, no, hold on for a second. Why would we ever assume that every writer and redactor and editor of the Old Testament, New Testament, of everything got every theological thing right when we're still arguing about right. theology now. It's like, well, maybe they just didn't get everything right. Maybe there's a progressive or revelation or what Gerard would call, it's a text in travail. It ebbs and flows. It it includes all these stories and all these perspectives. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sometimes they fucked yeah. it up. And that's okay because our authority isn't the Bible. Let's, let's Thank you. You know what I mean? Like, Thank you. Like, that should not be our authority. That's it's important. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, shut up. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Look, so G, here's the thing. I just, I just did this event in, um, I just did this event in Georgia over the weekend and I give, gave them everyone there a little Bible quiz. It was like three questions. And it was like, what is the Christian's ultimate authority? Um, and they assumed, they assumed the answer for most Christians would be the Bible, but you know what? The, that's not what the Bible says. If I go to the Bible, the Bible right. says, it shows, if I read the Bible, I read Jesus saying all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So again, Christ is our authority, not a book. Uh, and then I want to just say something quickly about Martian, Martianism. Um, Martian's heresy was not that he saw the difference between the Old Testament God and the God that Jesus described, because every early church father noticed that and, and acknowledged that. That wasn't Martian's heresy. Martian's heresy was specifically the conclusion of that, noticing that difference, that that, that other God was a devil or a demon uh, or a false God. And now that's not what we're saying. What we're, we are saying is that those people in the Old Testament misunderstood, misheard, uh, and attributed things to God that, weren't, that should not have been attributed to God. Um, what the other church fathers did that, that Martian wasn't able to do, and I think Origen was the one that pointed this out, M Martian's heresy was that he read it too, and this is the irony, does that Martian read this Old Testament scriptures too literally, that he was not, he was unable to read those violent passages as allegories, as like, in other words, looking for a, 
looking for Christ in those stories because he's there. Christ is in those stories, but not if you take it literally. Yeah, this is this is an interesting. Okay, I want to touch on <clears throat> something that. Um, well, going back to this question, and Matt, you said it. You know, first thing you were saying that the Bible is not the is not our ultimate authority, which I'm glad because it didn't come around until the fourth century. So, like, we it's kind of a good thing. But my thing is like, wow, if the Bible is not our ultimate authority, what is? And I understand Christ is our ultimate authority, but what is that? So, like. You know, Jesus said to It's Jesus' last name according to Richard Roy. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually ah, I, just no, fine. <laughs> so if we understand the Christ as being something that's transcendent in nature, that's not limited to the the human Jesus that walked two thousand years ago. So then this is an interesting point that if Christ is our authority and Jesus, you know, talked to Peter and he said, Hey, you know, to you, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He said that. But then he said that he spoke, he was speaking, I believe, this is my understanding, is that he spoke as representative of the human race. And so he said, you know, he calls himself the, the, the child of mankind, the son of man is basically another way of saying, I'm one of you guys. I'm one of your ch- offspring. I'm so, so you know, this idea that, oh, to you, and he told this to Peter, he's like, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, but to you, I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So, and I don't think he's talking to Peter, like the, that's the only guy and man, you know, he's not even here. Anymore. Well, he think, was the first Pope. I mean, come on. <laughs> right. If you're talking to a Roman Catholic, <laughs> a Roman Catholic friends may have different ideas about that. Yeah, but I, think so. uh, um, but I, I, I think, and again, that's a, to me, that is a colossal error of, of that tradition because, again, it's another way to distance any of these truths from people, from our everyday life. I don't think it's applying to one human being. But he, he he's talking to Peter, but he's basically handing the keys. He's saying, look, I know you can recognize that I got some authority here. I'm living a life in such a way that I'm living like – Wow, this guy's something different. You know, he seems to be in control of things um, in in ways that the other human beings aren't. But he's like, no, 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 no. But I'm one of you guys. All right. So here to you, I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So I would venture to say, and I do tell this to people, is like, you know, no one's in control but you. Like you're the one driving this car. You got the keys. Like who's driving the key, the car, so to speak, of the kingdom of heaven? It's us. We got the keys. We're the ones in control. Who's the ultimate authority on the earth? Us. There's nobody else. And that and people like freak out about that. Be like, well, that that messes. Man, I thought God was in control. I was like, yes, but where's God? You know, like this essence of who we like, once you start to realize who you truly are, then you realize you're like, man, guys. So if is God violent? Well, are you violent? Is really the real question. Like if you're not violent, then God's not violent. And if you're violent, then your understanding of God is yeah. going to be violent. I mean, it's just well, yeah. how it works. It's like our theology is a projection of how we view ultimate reality, how we view ourselves. At a, because your theology changes when you're enlightened, when you become more enlightened and you understand yourself at a different level, then your theology goes, well, that doesn't work anymore. That's why people deconstruct their religion because it's like, shit, this is not work for us anymore. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah, it's just dumb. It doesn't I, work. Yeah. I like, I like the, you know, what you're saying, you know, Jamal, um, I think, you know, because Paul, Paul makes, goes out of his way, actually, to make the point, and I think it's in First Corinthians, he says, we have the mind of Christ. Um, and I think that's meant to be, I, I think actually it's something that most Christians gloss over, like we don't even get what he's saying there. Because actually, the, the shocking thing is, I mean, it's really, if you really look at what he's actually saying, he, he, right before he says, we have the mind of Christ, he quotes an Old Testament passage that says, who are we to question the mind of God? Who are we, you know, which is a, you know, a very a kind of a staple of old covenant theology that, oh, God's ways are higher than ours. And we don't understand these things. And who, who, who is, who are we, who is the, who is the, the uh, pot to question the potter uh, on the wheel? And um, why have you made me this way? So P- Paul quotes the, that, that idea and his response is, but we have the mind of Christ. So it's, it's essentially like saying, you know, who are we to question God? Well, we are, we are Christ. We have the mind of Christ. So we absolutely have the, the authority and the power to question these things and to look into them ourselves. Like, because we do have, thank you for that button, because we do have Christ living in us. And what, what's missing for, for many of us, and ironically, 
uh, you know, people that call themselves Christians, what's missing for many of us is that the ability to even begin to um, to uh, nurture the Christ in us, the mind of Christ in us, to discern, to begin to discern these things. Like we, we're, we've just become so lazy. We just say, well, it's not in the book, so game over or, you know, the question solved. And when that's not, that was never the point. The God's whole point was he wanted to be so, he wants to abide in us, we abide in him. And we have this living, vibrant connection to God. And then something good happens because of that. There's a, you know, all things are made new, including us. We're part of this new creation that, that God wants to be doing. And the only way that really happens is like, you know, the mind of Christ is awakened in us, right? We're renewing our mind daily. We're, we are walking out these things and God wants us to, to make use of that. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, th- I, I think that's the danger of, um, of t- holding too closely to the Bible because, oh, that's what God was doing 2,000 years ago. Yeah, well, that, yeah, maybe that was what he was doing 2,000 years ago, but what we're missing is what does he want to do right now? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So a, a couple of things. Um, Jamal, I don't appreciate that you're saying so many cuss words, so fuck. <laughs> it's not, it's not thank it's not thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, wait, because like, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I feel out of place, so I had to say well, that because Matt, because um, Matt, I was beating you on the dings. I know, and I can't let that happen. So, mm-hmm. and second thing, okay, so <clears throat> I'm sure there's going to be some rebuttals because, and I don't always like to split up like, oh well, the Old Testament God is violent, New Testament God is not, blah blah blah, because then we have these instances, of course, and this is what people will bring up. You have the temple incident with Jesus, right? And you have Jesus saying, go get some swords. Oh, boy, here we go. So, so, so apparently, <laughs> just to play devil's advocate, you know, and we have the whole book of Revelation. And we have the the, uh, the incidents with Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so what would you guys say to those rebuttals that potentially, I mean, depending on our audience, uh, would be coming our way? Yeah. Always problematizing things, Matt. I have to shots. It's early, but I, you know, it's, it's five o'clock somewhere. Well, I mean, this, this is, this is the kind of stuff that I've been, I have been having this conversation for easily 11 years. Totally. Uh, so yeah, I started yeah. my blog. And so I literally have answered all of these questions so many freaking times. Um, so just plug your blog and then let me, well, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me just try quickly. Like, okay, the temple incident, the whole thing about him having a whip, if you read it specifically, he, he fashions the whip and it says he drives out the animals. So right. he doesn't, he doesn't whip people in that, in that, uh, passage. Also, by the way, that event comes immediately after Jesus riding in on a donkey into the city and weeping over the city because quote, they did not know the things that make for peace. So he comes in as a humble Messiah weeping because they don't understand the things of peace. And then he goes to the temple and drives everything out. So it's not like he suddenly does this 180 of like, oh, I'm so concerned about peace. I'm so humble. Let me go kick some ass in the temple. That's not what happens. Um, the thing about um, the thing about going by a sword, just briefly, again, it, just go to the passage. He tells you in that passage in Luke, um, he says, the scriptures about me must be fulfilled. And he quotes a specific scripture about him being numbered among the transgressors or the lawless. And so in other words, like them having some swords on them when he's arrested is enough to fulfill that prophecy. He even says that when he gets arrested, um, that this thing says these things must be done. So it's, it's really purely just in fulfillment of a prophecy. It's not a, in fact, if you think that Jesus comment about going by buying a sword is intended to be about self defense, then notice a few verses later when someone uses the sword for that very purpose, what is Jesus response? to rebuke them and tell them they don't know what they're doing and put it away and all that. So we can get into the other things. I think revelation gets really screwy because first of all, anyone taking that book, literally you're already off, off the chart. Um, the, the violence, the sword coming out of Jesus mouth, there is not a literal sword. It's, it's a spoken word, right? Uh, the blood that's on him is his own blood. Um, the way Jesus not according, blood. not according to Driscoll, well, not according to Driscoll. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Mark Driscoll. Uh, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong about that. Um, so anyway, you know what I mean. Like, I, here, and I guess here's my thing. Uh, here's my thing too is about when when we see Jesus, because because these these things we're bringing up are minor things or they're they're cryptic things or like oh you know they're not the they're not the rule. These are these are smaller exceptions, right? 
when plain spoken out there, Jesus is constantly all through the Sermon on the Mount, all through what he modeled, Father, forgive them, you know what they do, like all these kind of things. You know, if, if uh, my kingdom was not of this world, if it were, my disciples would fight, which is what he says to Pilate. So we have all these examples of Jesus being explicitly nonviolent. And then what we have that are Christians saying, yeah, but what about like, mm-hmm. that's your problem right there, because you're not really you're trying not to follow the things that are clearly spoken. And you're trying to refute them with things that, well, maybe I can grab this over here and use that to obscure this something that's really clear. Uh, yeah. that's, that's just the wrong, yeah. the wrong posture. Which I think going back to something Jamal said, I think we really do get, we create the gods we believe in and then we get those gods and, and it fundamentally right. impacts and fundamentally changes the world in which we live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, mm-hmm. it does. And I, you know, so, I mean, you can point to these stories, but I, I, I tend to, you know, even the Ananias and Sapphira, you know, like that, that example from the book of Acts, like, you know, regardless of if that happened, you know, like people, you know, there's debate as to, you know, did Peter kill them? Did, you know, yeah, I think he did. Uh, it was Peter. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's. <laughs> You know, would not that and again, I'm not this is not a knock on Peter, but really would we be surprised? Honestly. No. Would we be well, surprised? Well the funny the, the funny thing is that we'd get more offended if you said that than if God right. did. That's right. what right. blows my mind. If you said Peter killed him, oh my God. Oh, how could you say that? If you said, Well, God killed him, like, okay, well, yeah, cool. we, we're yeah, good with that. Cool. And it's like, wait, wait, that's not good. <laughs> but I mean, when you're when you're trying to set up a quasi state, you know, when you're trying to set up <clears throat> A way, I mean, I've seen some horrendous things done in my day in the name of the church. Right. In the in the name of like uh, you know, creating an organization that was supposedly like I've seen I've seen some really abusive, I mean, psychologically abusive things go on, you know, in what what even even some of the house church crap that I've been a part of, you know, coming out of the institutional church. I mean, it's bad stuff. Oh, yeah. To the point, to the point that it's like, oh yeah, like people can do this. People can people can and, and do this in the name of God. Do this in the name of of protecting the the thing that we've created. Of doing, I mean, some really heinous, mm-hmm. psychologically damaging, you know, behavior. So uh, again, I think that people resort to these kinds of tactics, violence in the name of God, um, really comes down to why do people resort to violence in general, not just in the name of God, I mean, what, but in general, people are, tr- people do, people do violent acts because they feel desperate. They feel like, okay, well, I'm not going to be heard. You know, if someone doesn't feel like they're getting heard and they, and they're, and they're, um, you know, pen, penning, you know, they're not like expressing themselves. Eventually there's a blow up, you know, and somebody wants to make their voice heard or somebody wants, violence is an attempt to accomplish a, a task, you know, whether if they feel not safe, if they feel like they need to protect themselves, if they, it's like, it's usually a response of the fight or flight mechanism that people are operating in, which is a high stress environment. Most of what Jesus taught when he's teaching doesn't even appeal to the fight or flight response. You know, it's a whole different mechanism. Um, and you know, it's, a uh, it really appeals to the heart. There's a, you know, obviously in science now we realize that there's a Parents, parasympathetic nervous system that surrounds the heart, which is not even governed by fight or flight, which is kind of a primitive area in our brain that governs <clears throat> human behavior. So it's so much of our ancient theology is mirroring the fight or flight response. And of course, we're projecting that onto God. But as we evolve, you know, and move into higher states of consciousness, which would be heart centered states of consciousness, which really appeal to love. And, but you can't get to that place unless you're at a place of rest and peace. And so that's um, really what's going on. You know, it, it, you don't, when you realize you don't have to, like we're more powerful than, you know, resorting to violence to get our way. We actually don't have to force the issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's an interesting, that's a different dynamic. And so then we're, we're conceiving of, wait, so could our conception of the divine be somebody who doesn't have to force their way, use violence to accomplish? Well, yeah, totally. Like, yeah. w- you know, the same way people do it when they're operating, how do you change nations? How have the, every revolution or, uh, you know, we, do you think of like some of the most effective revolution or cultural change m- movements have been done through nonviolence? Um, right. And ha- and how is that? It's because it's not, it, it doesn't it need. Happen. Yeah. That, that's it, the point. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whole different way, but that, that happens on an, even on an individual level too. Once we shift out of the fight or flight response. So, so much of this violent theology is to protect 
or to or, or to uh, accomplish or to you know get your you know to to exact a will on a on a on a on a place or a group of people, they resort to violence. It's just simply be, it's out of fear. It's that literally the fight yeah. or flight response well, um, I, in action. Yeah, and I want to say, look, you know, if if the question we're asking in this episode is is God violent, I'm just going to say no because not if God is like we see in Jesus. If Jesus truly is the one, like you know, it says in John. No man has ever seen God at any time except for the Son, and the reason He came was to make Him known to us. Which means we didn't know God clearly. We didn't. We had a misunderstanding about who God was before Jesus, and so Jesus came to correct that. And that there is a correction. I think if you look at Jesus and then you look at what you see, uh, the violence that you see in the Old Covenant scriptures, you would notice, ah, uh, this is different. And so for me, the answer to the question is God violent is no. So, so now then the second question would be, what about all that violence in the Bible? Well, who's doing all that violence? It's us or, or like natural disasters, things like, you know, there's a flood or whatever, or there's an earthquake or whatever. Um, you know, what would those primitive cultures, what would they have done? Well, there was a massive earthquake or there was a massive flood and a whole bunch of people died. Well, why would that happen? Well, God must be angry. Well, why is God angry? Well, it's probably because we weren't faithful enough and we weren't doing enough and we weren't, you know, whatever enough. So we're so sorry, God, and we won't do it again and we'll repent. But again, these are primitive ways of thinking. They're attributing to God. Uh, God, again, because in, in those primitive cultures, God's were typically, uh, their power was shown through force, through violence their ability to give give the armies success in war um, mm-hmm. or or they were you know send a famine or a plague again is a god really sending a famine or a plague or a disease no those are things that just happen but it gets attributed to a god uh, because again these people don't know what else how else to explain it or understand it mm-hmm. um, so I think yeah there's no I, I can't yeah I, I just can't accept that God as Jesus reveals him is truly if God is love and if God is like Jesus, he's not violent. That's exactly right. If God is love, then God is nonviolent. Now, that being said, love can be intense. Love can be, if my daughter's in the road and a car's about to hit her, I will shove her hard out of the street. Right. Love can be intense and love, love, can, love can be overwhelming. And, but, and this, is, this is what I try to um, uh, distinguish in, in From the Blood of Abel. Uh, uh, violence has the intent to harm, right. to inflict pain or suffering. And, and so, of course, love would never do that. We could never say here, I love you and I'm going to smack the shit out of you if you don't do what you're supposed to do. It's like, no, that's, that's inflicting pain and, and harm and suffering. Uh, even though love can be intense, it's not going to be, it's not going to have that uh, added thing on the end. Like, you're, right. you, know, you know, so I think it's always important to distinguish. God could be intense. I, 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 you can have intense experiences. Yeah. yeah, love can be very intense. It can be overwhelming, uh, orgasmic. I, I think um, uh, you get the uh, the wrath of God. It comes from the same root for uh, orge, right? For for orgasm, um, it's it's like this. Uh, I, I could be wrong on that, but I think well, that's know, what I, I like heard that. Just keep going with it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be intense. It could be overwhelming. It could be. Um, but it's not. It's not there to uh, to inflict suffering or cause right. harm. Yeah, that's a that's a really really good point that you bring up. I, I just I wonder. Um, well, I, the, the, what the picture that comes to mind is you know surgery, and sometimes you know like if you if you have ever mm-hmm. had surgery, I mean mm-hmm. that can be violent in the sense of you know there's a knife that's cutting yeah. you open and it doesn't yeah. it's painful and all that thing. But the yeah, yeah. The, the the aim is not punitive. Right. Right. Uh, the, the aim is is for healing, healing. and right. and mm-hmm. obviously like. Yeah, the, this the nature of the flow of events that happen, you know. And I've had times in my own life. I think about my own journey um, of just it was hard. It was there was I really believe love the flow of love the God's work in my life um, was kind of violent in the sense that it 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 there were things I felt like I illusions I had totally bought into mm-hmm. that that had to come crashing down and it felt really intense and violent oh, and it didn't yeah. feel good. And I, but I, right. but, you know, I really see the hand of the divine in and through it and it felt very violent, obviously, but it was never punitive is never mm-hmm. like, it was never for harm and never for like punishment. Like, I don't even know that that's even, I mean, that's just like, Oh, I just want you to feel this pain because you know, Hey, that's what you get. You had to come in like nothing like that. It's, 
Um, no. And we, it's just like, as if you think of a parent, like no parents, just unless you're twisted, you know, and you, you, you know, there's some, there's, <laughs> right. there's some, you know, psychological problem, which you get pleasure out of seeing people in pain, then that's just not a normal human response. Um, and again, what gets projected onto the divine is right. unbelievable. But yeah, this this idea of somehow there's something healing and 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 restorative of in seeing you know people be tortured or burned alive or you know you know which is our concept of hell in, in Christianity. So it's just like they're just such it's so divorced from any form of decency and um, of, of 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 an ethic of love. It's just. It's unbelievable, you know, but again, I don't want to, it's not unique to Christianity. No. I mean, this is, this is just true of no. all groups, no. you know, but yeah, it's, it's just a projection. Again, it comes down to like, is God violent? And it, it really does. It's like, well, whatever your projection of God is, what if it's a mirror of mm. your, your projection of reality? Like that's really what mm. this is about. Right. Again, that's a great point. Cause if you mm. believe, and I think you could easily, <laughs> easily prove this is true. Um, if you're someone who believes that God is violent and that that's okay and that's even appropriate, then you're probably also, uh, you know, very tolerant of lots of other kinds of, you know, national violence and um, all other forms like capital punishment and things like that. Because again, well, if God does it, then why would it be wrong for us? For well, yeah. sure. <clears throat> yeah. Too often that's the case. Yeah. But uh, as we wrap this puppy up, uh, great episode, guys. I, I enjoyed myself. I had a great time on this one. Um if you want to keep uh, this conversation going if, uh, for our three listeners out there, uh, we have a pa- mom and dad, <laughs> we have a Patreon. We have, mom and dad, <laughs> give us some money. Uh, Patreon.com slash, is it Heretic Happy Hour or the Heretic Happy Hour? It's Patreon.com slash Heretic Happy Hour. We also have a, a website, heretichappyhour.com. Please visit it. We got our store there. All the episodes are there. And uh, yeah, yeah, check it out. And um, speaking of our Patreon uh, supporters, by the way, thank you guys so much. Um, we've just recently made a, a shift. Uh, we've done something new uh, between our Patreon page and our Facebook group. So we've revised our tiers. The The entry level tier uh, is now $2. And if you're at the entry level or above, what? Uh, as a, what? $2? Oh, you say two? A month. $2 Wait. a freaking month. I don't, do you, I don't know. Have we? Have we done the math on that? That's like seven cents a day. Like seriously? Yeah, it's it's. Can people can people expensive. afford that? Do you think? I I would think oh, most ninety nine percent of the people listening, all three of them, can afford that. So uh, <laughs> so, so two out of three. <laughs> so here's here's the deal though. Here's what we did. I think it's kind of cool. So not only did we drop it to two dollars, um, if you're the two dollar level or above and you're a Patreon supporter, we have a a brand new special private. Uh, Facebook group only for uh, Patreon supporters. So in addition to getting all the bonus content, bonus interviews, all the cool stuff on the Patreon side, you also get entry into this private Facebook group where we're going to continue these conversations that we're having um, right here on the podcast. So that that's where you would go and join that Facebook group. Now, in addition to that, what, we, what we've also done is we have a second group, um, which really what, what we did was we took the, the older Heretic Happy Hour Facebook group, which already was out there, uh, and just renamed it. We uh, gave it a new name. It's called now Heresy After Hours. That one is free to join. Um, you don't have to be a Patreon supporter to join that group. And that group is not limited to topics from the podcast. So uh, in fact, not only not only is it not limited to topics on this podcast, we've actually invited um, you know, like Seth Price from Can I See This at Church and Jason Elam from Mess- Messy Spirituality Podcast and Zach Crater from bros Bible and beers and some other guys to like join us. And this would kind of, if anything, we've opened it up and widened the net to expand the conversation um, about anything to do with deconstruction. So it's um, we're excited about this. So really what we're doing is we're giving you two groups, two different ways to have these kind of kind of conversations. And um, yeah, so check them both out. And I think they're both actually really awesome. Yeah. And what are you guys doing on the 17th of August? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Hopefully, I don't know. Hopefully, hanging out with you, man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because right. uh, okay, the seventeenth of August, I'm gonna fly you guys down. Thanks, Jamal. Well, Thank you, Jamal. <laughs> and by I, I mean choir, and, and I don't mean me. I mean the whole like it's it's more than me but um, <laughs> it's but mainly you but mainly it's actually you. not me it's actually not me at all but you guys will be you guys will be coming down flying down to the southern california because we're doing we have our get, check this out t- 
this is our second year, right? Woo-hoo! So this is our, our two year anniversary live show. Yeah. This is a live show, two year anniversary live show that will be at the sidecar donut um headquarters uh their corporate space there in costa mesa and it's going to be fantastic and we're gonna have uh so mom and dad and derek and no i'm just kidding about derek because i don't know if he can make it but <laughs> just just kidding we're gonna have people from the area that will come out this is our second we hope the listeners if you're in the southern california area that you for sure um mark your calendar for the 17th i believe it's what 6 p.m 6 or 6 30 yep. yep 6 p.m um, yeah so yeah. Yeah, so 6 p.m., right? Is that right? Yes. All right, 6 p.m. Yes. 6 p.m., August 17th. Mark your calendars. You can, you can, uh, if you have a phone, you can put that in your phone as a reminder. Would love for everyone to come out to, to our second, um, annual, uh, you know, uh, anniversary show. And that's, uh, Sidecar Donuts. It'd be fantastic. So, yes. 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 And we will do, we will do an event page. So look out for that in the groups. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And if you're not in the Southern California area, uh, buy a plane ticket and come out to visit us. Yeah, no excuses. Yeah, please rate and review us on iTunes. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. By the Do way, that. we we are on o- iTunes. Only if it's only if it's five stars, though. Yes. Yeah, because we got a negative review recently. <laughs> ah, boo. <laughs>